Who's excited? <laughs> Who's been up since like yesterday? <laughs> yeah. So uh, welcome to our talk, Hackers Hiring Hackers, How to Do Things Better. Eventually I'll figure out where's the right place to hold the mic. Um, so a key component of this talk is audience participation. So we're going to ask you lots of stupid questions so you can raise your hand. Um, we want you guys to share your war stories. Feel free to ask questions at any given point. And also, if you think we're just like spewing complete bullshit, let us know. Be respectful about it, but that's one of the great things about DEF CON, right? Is we can call bullshit and then talk about it. Okay? So. And uh, you probably will spew bullshit at some point. But not literally. <laughs> not literally. So. The way that Irish and I came, um, came up with this talk was, I was in his area for work, and we met up, and we were just drinking, eating, and we started talking about how bad things were trying to find a job in InfoSec, even for those of us who've been there for a while, let alone the noobs, right? So before we go into the introductions and stuff, whose first DEF CON is this? Oh man, that's awesome. Um, how many hiring managers do we have today? All right, cool. And how many of you are currently looking for people to hire? Nice. And how many noobs do we have? Like newly graduated, looking for your first InfoSec gig? All right. Excellent. That's great. <laughs> how many of you guys are actively looking for the next thing or just kind of curious what's going on? The rest of you guys are just here to heckle. Nothing else better to do. Okay. Yeah. Whoa. I know, right? So disclaimer. This talk was not done with any consent by our employers, past, previous, or future. This is us. Mike, it's gotta be up. This is Oh. Fail. Here. All right. This talk was not done with any consent by current, future, past, present employers. This is just Tot and myself expressing our frustrations and how we can do better both as hiring managers, as people applying for gigs. You can read all the legalese there. This is just us talking, okay? So, who are we? I'll let you guess which picture represents which one of us. Yeah. If you're gonna He's have the one me, with the bow. Yeah, if you're gonna have me wear the bow, that's gonna cost extra. This is yeah. Vegas. Who here is a human? <laughs> to which one? Yeah, I already did that. We're trying to figure out the mic thing, it's okay. So, yeah. Um, we're both currently in the information security industry. Um, I'm a security consultant with Rapid7. Uh, I basically do training and deployment. Irish, what do you do? Uh, typically do blue team protection, haha. <laughs> and uh, currently working uh, the director of a research uh, group. All right. Do you want to go ahead? And so why are we talking about this? Why the hell would we have this conversation at DEF CON? Well, you know, there's a lot of sexy talks about how to pwn this and how to pwn that and how to solder these things together, but there's very few that address the human element of this. This is a social engineering exercise, if you want to look at it and put it in that context. How do we get people hired how do we get people interested in our roles? How do I get that right resume that represents who I am and who I'm about to get in this role and get that next opportunity? And both of us, both sides, have not been doing a very good job of this. And we'll have some examples later, actually. We're doing a poor time in communicating our expectations of the job we're going to interviews without knowing how to showcase our experience and how to posture ourselves in trying to represent who we are and what can we do and how can we reduce that risk for the organization. 
And from a hiring manager perspective, sometimes we get those applicants, we get those interviews that we're like, we just don't get a good feeling that they're interested in that role. And from the job seekers perspective, right, us as hackers, either new or experienced, we're getting frustrated because we don't know what exactly We don't know exactly what they're looking for, right? The descriptions are ambiguous. Uh, we go in, they tell us that there's no hackers to hire and they really want a hacker. And then we show up with our experience and our willingness to learn. And we feel like we're getting shut down for no good reason. And how many of us have heard, oh, there's no hard, it's hard to find people to hire. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. So, yeah, it's, hard to find people to hire. it's hard to find people to hire. We scare the folks that we're trying to interview with or talk with. Scare folks in HR or the recruiters. And we keep shooting ourselves in this process. And getting and retaining talent is that social engineering exercise, right? How is it a social engineering size? Well, from a hiring manager's perspective, just finding people interested in the role and getting them to apply. Getting that upper management approval for the role, getting it through HR in a position description that they'll let get posted on the website. And not also, let's not forget, once we get them in that role, being able to nurture that candidate so they grow personally and professionally. And that they want to stay and help other people and yourself grow personally and professionally. Because how else can we be better individuals? How can else can we be better hackers without helping each other out? From the job hunter's perspective, hey, writing that convincing resume, writing that cover letter that expresses why I want this job. Why am I looking for that new role? Getting through that interview process, well, not just with the hiring manager, but with those other team leads that we also have to talk with and get their input and the folks that you're going to be working with in that role. Getting and negotiating that suitable offer for the environment that you're in, and just showing up on day one and getting on board it. Again, apologies for the technical difficulties. Yep. So expectations. This is one of the, we broke it down into four different core problems or core opportunities to improve. There is nobody to hire. Oh, but hey, you want to work in our corporate office in Wichita on a six month contract to fire with a rotating sock shift cycle. Because we've never gotten those calls before, right? There are folks to hire, just not in our market, not in your salary range, not with the requirements you have. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to set and adjust our expectations from both sides of the table and also nurture and grow the team that you have. Wynn talks about, and has for many years, and has now recently started a blog ser series of blog posts, and I wanted to stick this in here. Talk about hiring the unhirable. There are folks to hire. We gotta set our expectations appropriate to the organization, what you need, and also what's available out there. So, what do you want? Hey, I want a junior level, or I need an entry level person, but hey, they need assist. Five years of experience. <laughs> what? <laughs> Bingo. Because, right, so now it's, again, setting that expectations. What things can you pay for? What, what, how well did you socially engineer your supervisors, your bosses, and your financial team to get the funding you needed for that role match the expectations and requirements to that, right? 
We've seen those position descriptions that are all over the map. You want a jack of all trades and master of none. So what do you really, really want? And I'm not doing the dance, sorry guys. <laughs> it is too early and I have not drank anything yet. Do I'm not doing the dance. The dance? <laughs> hey, if you want a log monkey, you need somebody working a sock, say so. We, we've all seen those encrypted sort of job descriptions that make no sense and just have a list of buzzword bingo. And if a, um, a log monkey is what you're looking for, that's okay because there's a lot of broke ass college students who will take anything. <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't tell them that they're going to be a log monkey and that it's going to be a learning you know, something that they can learn and grow into, they're not going to apply because they're going to think they're underqualified because something that a lot of us suffer from is that imposter syndrome, right? We're not good enough. We're not qualified enough. People don't like me. And your job descriptions aren't helping. We don't know that what you're looking for is entry level and that you're going to help us grow with your company, right? So just say what you want. So... What really matters oh. to your environment, to your team, to the business that you're supporting? I don't, they, they can't hear you. It is off mute. So what really matters to the environment, to the team, to the business that you're supporting? With that experience, don't ask for things just because. That's really going to limit your pool of applicants because, yes, there's going to be folks that go, well, I've never done this with X tool, and they're not going to apply. And that might be the perfect candidate for you, or that could be that perfect candidate within three to six months because you've helped them nurture and grow. <sighs> yes, we've seen those job descriptions. <laughs> we've seen those job descriptions that oh, you have to come from an Ivy League school, and you have to have those certifications that none of us could afford on our own. And we all know how that testing process is just so awesome. And another, another thing that's... I just give up. It's cool. So another thing that helps is letting people know if you don't have these certifications, if you're willing to get them within, like, X number of months... That's good to have on there, too, because that shows the job hunter that you actually care. So what do we end up doing? We end up beg, borrowing, and stealing from other companies that were able to nurture and grow their team. We need to help grow our own. We have to need to help nurturing our own. So, scope. Hey, what's that role for, right? What are you trying to do? Get into the specifics of it, Mr. Hiring Manager or Mrs. Hiring Manager. Or is this all of the things? You want a jack of all trades, master of none. We understand that that sometimes needs to be the case if you're in a small organization, you only have one or two people on your team. But where do they fit? Where are we supposed to fit within that organization? Does it make sense that we fit underneath IT or underneath legal? And certainly for a lot of startups, hey, we need a security person, so let's get a security architect and throw them underneath the manager of IT. And that sounds good in practice, or in theory, or I'm sorry, it sounds good in theory, but in practice, you're going to have issues because it's a conflict of interest, right? To make, the head of IT is going to be concerned about uptime, making sure your users are happy, that they have like 50 bazillion versions of Java just because. But security, you don't want that. So we're going to be constantly letting heads with our management if you have a setup like that. So it's really, really important for us to consider where we are going to put our people. And from the other perspective, hey, apply and the job is yours for all the money and the trip to Hacker Summer Camp. Don't we wish? There's certainly the conversations I've had with candidates that expected double and triple what the going rate was for that role in that area. 
okay, you guys are just trying to troll me, or are you really looking for a new role? Great question. So the question is, what is the rate? And that's dependent on where that organization is, physical location, and also what the job is and what it entails. And experience. There's multiple qualifiers that fit into that. Ah, uh, yes. Correct. Okay, so the question is, hey, would we have some references to figuring out what that rate is? And why don't we circle up after, and I can give you a couple of those. There's a couple of websites specifically for, hey, if I'm working in X location, what do I need to move to Y location? What's the equivalent to that? There's a couple of different um, salary surveys as well to read into and figure out what's going on and then figuring out what that is from the differential to the location that you're at. Yes, sir. Yes. So the scenario, yes, I would like an unpaid intern for my team with experience. Thank you for the segue. <laughs> because, yeah, he's absolutely right. So a lot of our hiring managers are stuck because we don't know how to, uh, how to properly convey to our HR or to our system what we really need. They just know what they think they want. So that's kind of when it becomes a social engineering exercise, right? All right. So application process, right? How do we even get this put together? And this needs to be done on both sides before we even make the first calls. Because you know what? The candidate could have finished the application process, hired, and started somewhere else before you've even reached out to them by email going, hey, how would you like to get an introductory phone call with our uh, HR recruiter? So how do we even find candidates? And that's us, hiring managers, getting out there and meeting them face to face, helping build that rapport, helping contribute back to the community even working online with stuff, okay? And it's great that we have a couple of hiring managers here and it's a great start, but we need to get our companies more interested in comp like Gascon, DerbyCon, et cetera, because we need, that's where they're gonna find the talent, right? That's where they're gonna see people who know their stuff, who are interested in hacking, who are interested in learning things, who are curious naturally, and they can use that and harness that but they look at our conferences and think we're just a whole bunch of drunk kids running around turning uh, pools purple. I haven't done that in years. I don't know what you're talking about. So, <laughs> hey, she's colorblind. Leave her alone. <laughs> anyway. So, the other thing to think about is your role, hiring manager, in talent. More than a lack of a technical staff or the lack of upper management in some of the things that one of the gentlemen here in the audience was talking about is that gap of middle management. We're the ones that do the staffing. We're the ones that actually go out and spend budget. And we go out and try to ensure the best optimal practices for using those tool sets in our environment trying to manage and reduce risk. 
When there's a failure at that level, then the whole thing falls apart. Oh yeah, let's talk about HR and recruiters. You have those paid recruiters, those overseas body shops you can tell by the first syllable of the voicemail or by the subject line. Need I say more? I will say that uh, the CEO of Eat24 has an interesting blog post called Dear High Headhunters, Fuck You. It's actually a, quite an interesting read. I would highly recommend it. So, types of questions. When you're figuring out what that position description is, that match should match up to the types of questions and scenarios you're going to be talking to during the telephone and in-person interview process. And it helps when you're writing in questions to look at the job description that you put out there, and then you can use that to kind of tailor your questions, right? Like, okay, well, we want this. How do I find out if this person actually has this or if they're trying to pass our filters? In that, defining those key areas, what's those interesting things? As one of the gentlemen re mentioned earlier, hiring a recent college grad with five years' experience, Olympic medals, and superpowers. <sighs> and compensation. You have an idea as a hiring manager for your particular area, what, or I would hope, have an idea. Pay them what they're worth and what you're capable of. And if you can't, then how do we work other ways? Vacation, flexible work schedule, maybe work it out in a training budget to help nurture and grow that individual if we can't pay them the compensation. There's different ways to work around that from both a hiring manager perspective and someone who's trying to get hired. It's not just about the Benjamins. At least I hope not. We want professional development. Thank you, Startup Jackson. Just the thrown workplace, just the stock options and the free lunch isn't going to cut it. Okay? The beer cart and the ping pong table isn't going to cut it either. An awesome UX, love it. So this is going to vary wildly depending on who's looking for a job, and we recognize that, especially millennials who are entering the workforce. They're going to have a completely different set of expectations than the majority of us who have been in the scene in the industry for a while, right? They might be happy with the t-shirt and the cool free lunches and beer on Friday. So sometimes you can offer different things to different people that you're looking to hire. And that's okay, right? So let's talk about the application tracking systems that we all love. And from a hiring manager, we have to remember, that's the first or second step after looking at that position description you have posted and giving that first impression to the candidates and hiring, okay? Why are you asking for PII in the application process? Why, and do a check. So, perfect example. Why are you asking for social security number, driver's license number, and state for, what is this, a senior manager of information security? Yeah. That should disqualify them. If they answer those questions, just be like, nope. <laughs> so, another great example of the sexy, right, is they're asking for date of birth and driver's license number. Uh, by the way, this is a CPA auditor company. Uh, the HR gal that replied back to me saying I didn't get an interview never responded to my emails about, uh, can I talk to your information security team about the privacy violation you have on your application website, please? Because notice the nice, lovely certificate there, too. That's a great question. So someone Please. brought up the fact that you, know, you have to do a background check before you bring somebody on, right? 
and you still, how do you do that? Well, look, you need to ask for that PII. Do you want to address that? In the consideration of time? Just quickly. Okay, background check. That's not whether somebody's qualified or not. That's just saying what sort of background does this person have in regards to credit and legal law enforcement issues. As hackers, some of us make bad decisions. <laughs> Others are just caught. <laughs> so, background checks. Yeah, that's done after the interview process because that costs some money. And that is directly against a line item in my budget. So if I'm serious about someone, I'm going to have the conversation with them beforehand of, hey, this is the HR policy for the organization. I need to do this. Is there anything we need to talk about beforehand? And there's a form and a proper way of submitting that form with the PII on it so that it's safeguarded and done appropriately. Correct. A lot of times this information isn't even being used, and you, sir, are going to be my segue person for the rest of this talk. <laughs> oh, I can't put special characters in a password, guys, really? Oh, but it's a gaming company, and you know, it doesn't make sense. This one was weird. Here, click on this link, and I get this pop-up going, you're logging in as username HR, but the website does not require authentication. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Fail. So, this gentleman here was filling out a job application and was frustrated enough with this question. <laughs> Which meme do you most identify with and why? Mine is the same for work, by the way. <laughs> so, this he did not put in any context into what sort of job he's applying to. Now, if this is an online media company or a role that deals with this, it might be relevant. Certainly for InfoSec, it would not be, my opinion. This might also, depending on the question, reflect a little bit on ageism, too. Okay. So, yeah. So that's part of that, selecting the right questions and at the right time. Should this be an essay question when I'm not sure you're looking for a humorous, humorous or serious answer? Or would this be more appropriate for an in-person interview where you can have an interaction and conversation about it and why? It's the fail boat. Okay, hackers, hacking the resume. No BS, guys and gals. We can figure it out relatively easily with some of the questions we're asking. It's about matching that role in the big HR system, knowing what the terms mean, trying to reflect what you are trying to do or want to do in this role. Because we're going to throw the bullshit flag. Even if you have limited experience with a tool or um, a network technology managing things, please do put it on your resume, but let us know how limited or experienced you are with that tool. Because if you've been into it in the first place and you can navigate around and you've done like a very lightweight penetration test as part of your coursework, I want to know about that. Because that's relevant to my interests. So that way I can help you work on your path to become a pen tester, if that's what you want to do and if that's what I'm hiring for. Yes, I have a file of the worst resumes ever. 
Yes, I, I, will, uh, I do redact them to protect the guilty, but those are I use as examples when I'm mentoring my uh, interns and young staff on what not to do. Don't give me any more. I have enough examples. And it's tailoring that resume to make it relevant to the employer, to the hiring manager. It needs to be long enough so it reaches where it's supposed to go. Oh, it's only supposed to be one page, it's only supposed to be two page. Does it reflect what you can and want to do so it reaches where you want to go? Honestly, for myself, I have a two page resume and I have a full CV that's five pages. And I submit both. And when you're building out your resume, pay close attention to what you name it. If you call it resume.docx, I'm going to probably just put it in the folder and forget about it because I'll have like 50 of them with the same exact name. It would be hard to distinguish you. So pay attention to your file names. Put like first name, last name, CV, dot, doc, or something like that, right? Also, sanitize your metadata, please. Yeah, that's the next slide, though. <laughs> it's all right. So the one or two page or the full CV, I send both because humans want different things. Different hiring managers want different things. Different HR folks want different things. I've even run into companies where if the resume was not formatted to their company standard, you didn't even get a phone call. Oh, now, if... No, they didn't. You, you had to know. Yes, file names make a difference and sanitizing the metadata. Managers make mistakes, HR makes mistakes, and we lose documents. And good labeling helps you out. Determining if you're qualified or not is not your job yet when you're applying for a gig, hackers. It's the job of HR and perhaps the, audit, the tracking system and that hiring manager to make that determination. Keep that in mind when you're applying and looking at the, over those roles. And it's okay to apply for things that you're, you may not be qualified for yet, but are interested in, as long as you have the building block and are willing and able to learn. So you have the heavyweight application tracking systems, the uh, Telios, ICMS, the heavy ones that we just love to hate, and then you have the lightweight ones that are just a simple submission, keeping track of who's submitted in and whatnot. With those, especially the heavyweight ones, it's recommended to be one of the first to apply. And trying to fill out every application box or text box in that application. And if you don't feel comfortable filling it out, put a dot, put a period, something else in there. On those resumes, web safe fonts, be sure to spell check and spell check again and have a friend who's an English major read it over for you. Don't use the graphics or special characters. The ATS systems can't digest it and it will spit it out. And don't think that HR is going to call you to ask you, hey, your resume got messed up when you applied, you need to resubmit. So, email applications. It is, let me lay something down, okay? You may be a unique little snowflake, but that should not be reflected in your font. I do not want to see text that looks like a 12-year-old girl with a gel glitter pin wrote your email. Okay? Use like Times New Roman, 12 point font, whatever. Just make it easy for me to read. And if you're trolling and using Comic Sans, that could be okay too. As long as I can get that that's a troll. That email application, that's your opportunity for that cover letter on why you want that job, why you think you match that job. What other things that you can't easily convey in the resume? And of course, email, digital signature, a bonus. Hey, you understand how that works. And also, I. Uh, oh, go ahead. oh, I was just going to say also, check your copy paste. I don't know about you guys, but I'll write an intro to an email and then I'll copy it, paste it, and then sometimes forget to change the company name. It's a little awkward and you're not going to get a call back. So. Real quick, for the military 
in government jobs, they have their own special Snowflake website, which is the worst unwieldy from death you've ever experienced. And it was breached, like they all are. Be sure to answer the qualifier questions as best you can. The hint with that is to look at the description of all those questions, write it up first, then go into the submission process. If you're trying to wordsmith while the application is up, you're going to set yourself up for failure. So we talked about this, customized resumes. Hey, that one or two page resume for the human digestion, awesome. The full CV, submit into those heavy CV systems, the ATS systems, pardon me, because they're doing that word matching. You need the indicators. Go to the next slide, and, and you're not going to be the second person for segues in our talk. But also, before we go, it's helpful to have a couple different versions of your resume. I know you hear that all the time. Um, but I have two main ones, one with my hacker stuff on it and one without it. So there's one resume I have that has my talks and stuff, because some companies do care about that and want to see that. It shows that you're active in the community, you're learning, you're doing stuff. Other people might get a little scared, right? So you might want to trim it down or make, make sure you only have like the professional talks on. You know, it's kind of hit or miss depending on the company. And you might not want to work for those folks who would turn away, you know, you speaking at that time, right? Because that means they might not pay for you to help. <laughs> so yes, there are little tricks for uh, when you do applications on USA Jobs. That's just one of them. This is probably not the forum to further discuss that. Because I'm going to say, don't hack with your resume. It's not yes, I have gotten folks that have applied for my jobs with exploits in the PDF. <laughs> Seriously? Yes, I check for those things. Come on. Nor, let me put that caveat in there, is the application process an opportunity to do a penetration test on the application system? That's after you get hired, okay? And you have the get out of jail free letter. Since we're talking about government stuff, security clearances. It does not belong on the resume. It does not belong on LinkedIn. You're making yourself a target. Go read the documentation that you read from DSS and OPM. And no, it doesn't matter. Yes, it all got stolen. All right. Again, there's if, some disagreement as well. Like, we've had a lot of people who are like, well, no, I've always put it on it. They won't consider my application unless it's on there. And for that, there's ways you can kind of get around it. You can say, like, security clearance upon, or information upon request, speak with, what is it? This see, information can be verified in uh, conversation with your personal security officer. And yes, I've uh, known folks that have lost opportunities over that. And all I can say is if that organization can't handle doing this in the right process, in the right way, do you want to work for them? This is a time to communicate, folks. Professionally looking email, professional looking cover letter, professional looking email address, digital certificate, whole nine yards. Because we're going to be expecting that within the work as well. And yeah, I'm going to Google that email address, and I'm going to Google that username. So we're going to kind of run through uh, a bit of the quick quicker since we're running uh, short on time minutes before the next talk. So yeah, um, cover letter important. Do you provide it? It's hanging in the left or right. Make sure you have friends with an English major. They can read it over. Make sure it doesn't suck or sucks less. <laughs> Use your network, okay? You're at DEF CON, right? Which, by the way, woo! <laughs> woo! <laughs> right, so we're at DEF CON. There's tons of events, contests, all of these things that you can participate in and meet new people, villages, workshops. If you're not participating in these things and only sticking with your small group of people, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. 
And it's also a great way to meet hiring managers. If you did not make note of the people who are hiring, you kind of failed. Uh, can, can the people who are hiring uh, raise their hand again, by the way? Thank you. Okay. Right? So working with recruiters, we have a couple of different types of recruiters out there. Um, a lot of the times, you are not a special snowflake to the recruiter. They just did a search of who has something on their LinkedIn, and then they'll spam you with an email. It's not a guaranteed job. But I would also treat every conversation with a recruiter as an interview. Best behavior, best language, and selective answering on those questions, right? It's you trying to figure out which of those inter uh, recruiters that you're working with that's one of those body shops overseas or is it actually a legit recruiter locally with working with that company trying to match up that skills to what in that environment and make sure you understand the odds we're not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because we know there's a whole bunch of us looking for work but what we don't realize is that the odds of us getting a job are much higher than the odds of us The stump the monkey questions get us nowhere, folks. And we've all had them. So what do we mean by stump the monkey? Basically, it's to find out how smart or dumb someone is by playing like a Jeopardy type game, right? So it's best to kind of avoid rapid fire questions. It's important to know if someone's bullshitting or not, but you're not there to sit there and, you know, have them regurgitate their last couple of years of college. We're talking about that question bias. We're talking about not being a dick. It's amazing we have to have a day that says, let's not be a dick day. So what if the candidate does not know how to work with oak or maple or pine or Palo Alto or Cisco? Can they learn how to work with that? Can they learn how to use that tool to find the threats in your environment or pwn that box? or write that policy. I don't care what port, or excuse me, what protocol uses port zero. I can go look that up. We should not be reinforcing the rote memorization answer of questions that our school systems have ingrained in us. It's about thinking outside the box, thinking out what's going on, and figure out how to stop the badness. family illness I've come across, folks who went to school. Hey, the recession is still out there for some environments and places out there. It's hard to find a good job. Okay. We hear that excuse that it's not a cultural fit. They're not technical enough. We need to stop using this as a crutch for not hiring someone. We hire for aptitude. We hire whether they can or learn to do something and do it and protect our environment. Can they do the job? Can they learn? Are we looking for that purple squirrel? That's what the recruiters call it when you have something you cannot find. Or even worse, are they looking for the plaid unicorn? <laughs> I had to go to Etsy to get a picture of a plushy plaid unicorn because I couldn't even find an artwork because nobody's drawn it yet. 
how hard is it to find that perfect candidate if I can't even find it? So we're just coming back here on the trifecta. We want to know that they're willing and able to learn, that they're interested in their job, that they're interested enough to protect our environment and our users, right? We want passion. We're not going to, we shouldn't use the passion as an excuse to have them work overtime and burn them out because then we're just going to have to recycle through new InfoSec people. And also, we want the ability to fail and admit that they failed or were wrong because that's how we learn. So, hackers, time the research. Find what that company you're trying to interview with, figure out what's going on, use Glassdoor, figure out what's going on, because that is knowing your target, knowing who you're trying to socially engineer to get into that job, right? Have your three bullets and stick to them. Question everything, right? Please wear pants. Or at least a kilt, okay? It's a question everything, and it's also a question on timing. Did the interviewees give you an opportunity to interview them? Or did they give you the token three to five minutes at the end? That tells me something about that team. At the end. <laughs> I've gotten these interviews, I've gotten these emails too. We have to find that. Hiring managers, we need to stop leaving people hanging. We need to let them know as soon as we can figure it out that we're going on to someone else. And we also need to be able to figure out a way, even if it's mo uh, months or years down the road, be able to provide some feedback to those folks that we interviewed about why we couldn't hire them. And just a little bit note about not following up with the folks that think you're not going to hire them. It's a really small community. I know there's like 20,000 people here at Zephom, but there's like 's so hackers follow up as well send a thank you email to everyone you talked and interviewed with even the receptionist because they helped you get that opportunity to have that conversation I actually got my first info set job uh, they, I was 10 minutes late because of the torrential downpour in traffic in Seattle but I got the job and they didn't disqualify me for uh, work bias against me because the uh, PA to the hiring manager thought I was adorable and thought I was so polite and they pay attention to those things so just keep that in mind show some class even send a snail mail thank you card. Yes, the ones do exist. But best not to send the connection requests on social media quite yet. That's a little creepy. Yes, I do, yeah. You gotta remember that there's some folks that only add people that they know and trust, KMT, right? No met trust. And there are other folks that add everybody in the world. And then as a final note, we just wanna bring up that a lot of us forget that we leave impressions on people no matter what side of the table we're on. So it's always good to be hypersensitive of how you portray yourself you never know if you're going to try to get a job with this person down the line. So, we like to, we threw, went through this rather quickly because this is a lot. There's a lot of little nitnoid things. It's those little things that ding us that gets our network compromised, and it's those little things that ding us when we don't get the job. 
or don't get the opportunity or don't get that person hired? Comments, concerns, no bullshit flags at all. Remember, you can leverage freeware online if you don't have the experience that employers are looking for. We're very bright people. Think outside the box, get that freeware, utilize it for a couple of years, put on your resume, and correlate it with what you're looking for. Exactly. Job seekers, what you said was please use open source software, freeware, to try to get that experience. Because a lot of times we will see those in corporate environments because our budget's like that big. Again, we talked about earlier, it's a question of timing, right? And also contribute back to the community. Yep. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, folks.